In this video, we're going to take a look at the log for shell exploit that's been around in the news over the past few days, just to get a general understanding of what this vulnerability is, why it's so impactful, and just get a little bit of insight about how this sort of thing happens inside of a project like log4j. I'm just going to give you an overall idea of this vulnerability. I'm not going to go over any exploitation of it, given that there's so many unpatched systems still. I don't want to give away those sorts of tools. I just want to give you an intuition behind what's going on with this vulnerability so that you can understand it for patching your own systems, or just if you're generally interested in this vulnerability and want to learn a little bit more about it. So starting off, let's talk a little bit about what even is Log4j. Well, Log4j is a Java-based logging utility, which is a part of the Apache logging service. And generally, Log4j is used in a lot of Java applications for simply logging data while an application is running. So it can log information about the application, it can log errors, debugging information. It's things to help developers troubleshoot their application when it's in production, and just understand any sort of problems that might be coming up while the application is actually running. So this is used in a lot of different areas. Um, I mean, I know for sure that it's used in things like Spring Core. Um, I know that that uses it quite frequently. And a lot of other Java projects use Log4j as a default component. And that brings us over to the why is this such a problem? Well, because of the amount of use that Log4j gets, it's actually implemented that or estimated that millions of applications are running Log4j. To make matters worse, the vulnerable versions are from 2.0 to 2.14.1, which is representing a large amount of the people actually running log4j. Not so many people are running the versions 1.0 upwards. Uh, it's more of the 2.0 up to the current version. Well, the current version before this exploit, which was 2.14.1. To add more fuel to the fire, the vulnerability is very trivial to exploit for anyone who is trying to do so. You're able to put this vulnerability into any location where you might see data getting logged. So typically you will see it in like HTTP headers, you'll see it in URL paths, and this allows us to be able to exploit this vulnerability very easily because we're able to put it into a lot of different locations and as long as the message gets logged, there's the potential for it to exploit our vulnerability. Because of this, we've seen it happen in a lot of different locations. We've seen it ranging in things from web servers, even down to Minecraft. I saw someone come up with an exploit for Minecraft of all things. So it's showing up anywhere that we see logging using log4j. So this vulnerability has a pretty severe impact as well. It has an RCE or remote code execution with a CVSS score of 10, 10 out of 10, because 10 is the highest possible score. The way that we come up with that score is based on how this is exploited. It can be exploited over the network. Nobody has to be authenticated to exploit it. It's very easy for someone to exploit it. And the impact of exploiting it is that you can run any code that you want. And that is, of course, a huge issue because it means that you can do things like taking over somebody's server. Um, you, can, you can do really anything. The, the um, impact is limitless. You have full potential with this. So that gives you a bit of an intuition about why this is a problem, right? It impacts so many different systems and it gives the attacker the ability to do pretty much whatever they want. Then we get into the more scary part, which is the fact that there is active exploitation of this vulnerability already. Because of how easy it is to actually exploit this, there's a lot of different people who are going out and exploiting it. So some ones that I found just looking around in the news is um, the Mirai botnet looks to be using this exploit as well as the Mushtick IoT botnet. So essentially what they're doing with this is they are using it to compromise computers because they can run any commands that they want. They can get remote, remote access onto these computers, which allows them to effectively take them over and bring them into their botnet. This botnet is then um, used for any number of different things, right? It could be used for like denial of service attacks. Um, oftentimes these compromised computers are sold to other attackers for them to be able to use as like jump boxes or for whatever extents and purposes they would like. Um, so it, it has a lot of potential to be exploited because of this. We're also seeing a lot of worms and exploits being developed actively. So one of the really concerning parts about this vulnerability is that because it could be run through the network, it's very easy to generate worms for it because if you compromise one computer on a network, you can start to send out the attack to anything else that you can see and you might be able to spread this very quickly. So you can see that there's a really scary potential for this to spread very fast and have a very severe impact if it does spread. 
So how did this actually happen? Like what, what's going on here, right? You would think that with a logging application, it wouldn't really be possible to do something like this. But the reason that this is possible is because in Log4j 2.0, they added in a functionality called lookups and specifically one called JNDI lookups. And this lookup wasn't restricted properly. So they weren't properly sanitizing the input from the users. And what happened is usually this is used for things like LDAP and DNS lookups, but it turns out that there's a functionality inside of this, which allows you to refer to a Java class through a URL. So you can use a URL to point towards a Java class. And it's actually interesting. You see this sort of thing happen relatively often in Java. Um, I've actually made videos um, in the past in some of my courses that talked about in Android, you can go onto a web browser and you can put in a file path as a URL and you're able to access that file through the browser. This is a similar sort of idea, just we're using a Java class rather than a file. So what's happening here is that since someone can just put in this malicious Java class, it can result in somebody putting in a class with malicious code. And then when they send off the request, that malicious code is executed and then they are able to do whatever, right? Take control of the system or something among those lines. And to help you understand this a little bit more, I put in a brief example. So the log.info there, it says request user agent. And then there's these two parentheses, right? The parentheses portion is how we actually place that parameter into the log message. So what happens is the parameters get replaced with the user agent variable. And if you're familiar with HTTP requests, when you send an HTTP request to a server, typically there's a user agent variable in the header, which tells it what user agent is trying to access the web page. So what happens here is when you send that request, you can customize the user agent to be whatever you want it to be. So when this happens, you can put in a malicious payload as the user agent. What will happen is when the user agent gets replaced in those parentheses, it acts as this JNDI lookup, which then interprets that input as code rather than interpreting it as actual text. So rather than just printing that information into the log file, it's actually going to execute. So what happens is if you can point this towards malicious code in some way, then you would be able to actually execute this vulnerability, right? So it'll actually run the code, which can be weaponized to cause this remote code execution type situation. So that's a sort of environment that we're seeing, right? So they're taking some sort of input from the header of the HTTP request. That's just one example, right? There's a lot of different ways that this can happen. Um, that would be one example. So it will get mapped into this parameter. And then this parameter is going to execute it as if it were code. So a lot of that might sound relatively scary, right? So how is this actually fixed and mitigated? How do we prevent this from being exploited? And the best answer to this is, well, you should update log4j to the latest possible version, which at the time of making this video is 2.15.0. And let me just um, preface this as well. Um, please make sure to look up the proper fixes and mitigations because it may change by the time this video is released. There's new information coming out constantly, but this is the current best advice, which would be to always update your log4j to the latest version. If you do that, you should be good to go. If you can't upgrade, if it's not possible, then you should go and set this com.sun.jndi.rmi.object.trustURL code base to false. If you do this, it should effectively stop this vulnerability from happening. I'm always hesitant to give up mitigations instead of fixes because mitigations can sometimes be worked around. There might be a way to get around setting this to false, right? So right now, this seems to be quite safe. We don't know if there's going to be some way around this. So updating is always your best course of action. As a final way of getting around this, there is a way to be able to set the system property, which is the format message no lookups or the environment variable, which has the same sort of name, to true. If you do something like this, as it looks right now, that should also stop the vulnerability. So you should do either one of these three, or all three if you're able to do so, just to make sure that you're perfectly secure. So hopefully this gives you a bit of a better understanding and idea of the log4j exploit. And hopefully you are able to now understand what's going on with this. And if you have any vulnerable systems, you should understand now how you go about fixing it. Luckily, it's quite easy to fix. So just updating the version, if it's possible to do so, you might need to rewrite some of your code base to work with the newest version, but it's worth it to avoid this sort of vulnerability from happening. So thank you for watching this and I hope that you enjoyed.